Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I am doing fantabulous. Yourself? Well, good. I'm doing great. Thanks. Yay. It's uh, after Easter. It and, is uh, Sunday. Everything's great. Yeah. yeah it's getting good. warmer. Everything's fantastic. And I do have a case for us today. Woo! Let's go. Week. I'm ready. Should I put All my right. seatbelt on? Ready? Some of these names, if I mis- mispronounce them, I'm sorry. I tried to look them up as best as I can. I'll help um, you with that, Jen. You know I'm really good sure at that. Sure you will. <laughs> Sure Just you will. Kidding. I don't know. I might not have problems, but we'll see. We'll see. Are ready? Yep, I'm ready. Let's go. All right. It was a cold and snow-covered morning in February of 2010 when Thomas and Lynn Love decided to take the scenic route to Woodbridge, which is a suburb of Alexandria, Virginia. The area had recently been pummeled by snow, and not once, but three times that month leaving record-breaking accumulations across the Washington, D.C. area. So the loves were happy just to get out and about and go do some shopping. They drove by Prince William Forest and turned east onto Miniville Road. The area was a sleepy suburb with wide-open roads interspersed with an occasional subdivision or neighborhood. However, large parts of it were still fields and woods, kind of like where we live. So you know how the deer often play dodgeball through mm-hmm. the traffic? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh-huh. It's not where I thought you were going with that. Yeah. yeah. Thomas drove more cautiously than usual. As their vehicle approached Alps Roads, Thomas saw something move. So he pulled over and got out of the car. And when his wife realized what they were looking at, she also got out of the vehicle. Uh-oh. It was a woman. Oh. Who was half-dressed, covered in slush and snow and blood stumbling toward them. She was scraped from the knees down, her face pitted with tiny red dots, and the whites of her eyes were reddish purple. Shivering, she said in a hoarse whisper, I've been raped and beaten. And where's Lisa? Is she alive? Lynn wrapped the woman in a blanket, put her in the car, turned up the heat, and then called 911. And there's no way at that moment that the loves could fully comprehend that they had just played a small part in catching a murderer, freeing a wrongfully imprisoned man from jail, and bringing closure to three families, all by saving the life of a half-frozen woman now seated in their back seat. Could you imagine? No. It'd be horrible. Thank goodness he was watching. Like, she, he, they could have totally missed her. Oh, yeah. Heroes, really. No, for real. Seriously. Five years earlier, two little girls, best friends Laura Hobbs and Crystal Tobias, decided to spend the day roaming their neighborhood of Zion, Illinois. Located between Chicago and Milwaukee, along Lake Michigan, Zion was established as a planned Christian utopia in 1991. The north and south streets in town are all named after people and places in the Bible. And aside from the gorgeous view of Lake Michigan, the main thing the city had going for it was the nuclear power plant, which unfortunately shut down in 1998, taking 700 jobs with it. In May 2005, Crystal Tobias, age nine, and Laura Hobbs, aged eight, were inseparable. Neighbors would say that you would never see Crystal without Laura. Crystal's family was a close-knit, hardworking family who had immigrated to the United States in 1988 and lived in a small ranch-style home on Gilboa Street. The neighborhood was mostly tiny, one-story homes in large lots, giving the feeling of being spacious while still being part of a community. One block from Crystal's house was the Beulah Park Nature Area. Like so many, Crystal's family was a blended family, but that made no difference to them. 
Crystal's older half-brother, Alberto Segura, was 15 in 2005 and was extremely protective of his baby sister. Crystal was a Girl Scout, had many friends, and was very well-liked. Just down the road from Crystal's family lived Laura Hobbs. Originally from Texas, Laura's mother, Sheila Holiba, had moved to Zion with her four children to get a fresh start. Although she never married Jerry Hobbs, the couple had been in a long-term relationship, and he was the father of three of her four children. Jerry Hobbs had plenty of run-ins with the law that went back to 1990, mostly stemming from alcohol abuse. When he got drunk, he picked fights and did stupid, sometimes violent things. His last stupid, violent thing he did was in Texas in 2001. After fighting with Sheila and being deeply drunk, he started chasing the residents of his mobile home community with a chainsaw. Oh. Hmm. Luckily, nobody was hurt, but that was due mainly to a quick-thinking neighbor who hit him in the back with a shovel. (laughs) Oh. Whoa. Yeah. Jerry Hobbs was charged with aggravated assault and sentenced to probation. And that wasn't a bad outcome, considering how much damage he could have inflicted, except that he did violate his probation and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. In 1990 and 1996, he was arrested for aggravated assault. And in the years leading up to the chainsaw incident, he was arrested twice for driving with a suspended license, twice for possession of marijuana, and several times for evading arrest or resisting arrest. He and Sheila kept in contact while he was in prison, and they, you know, they talked things out, he cleaned up his act, and he desperately wanted to be a part of his children's lives. Sheila, who was living with her parents by then, agreed that he could return to them in Zion once he was released. And according to his family and Sheila's, for all his faults, Jerry Hobbs was never violent or mean towards his children. After being released from prison in April of 2005, Jerry joined his family in Zion, where his daughter Laura had already established herself as one of the most popular kids in her school and neighborhood. She was also the one person among the neighborhood kids who reminded everybody when their curfew was up and when it was time to go home. She's a very responsible kid. (laughs) She's that kid. On Mother's Day, Laura begged her mother to let her go outside to play with Crystal. However, Laura was supposed to be grounded because she had taken some money from her mother's purse earlier that week. However, since it was really the first warm day of the year, her mother decided to let her go out. And although she stipulated that Laura needed to be home in time for dinner, it was Mother's Day, you know? Mm -hmm. Before Crystal Tobias went out to play that day, she had given her mother a flower pot with I love you, mom, spelled out in colored styrofoam letters. She'd also given her mom a coupon book, good for two days of watering the plants, one hour of helping with the housework, one big kiss and hug, and one hour of peace and quiet. Because like I said, it's Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. That's very cute. I could use a whole booklet of an hour of peace and quiet. (laughs) (laughs) Crystal didn't have a bike of her own, so she and Laura would ride together around the neighborhood on Laura's bike. Laura would pedal while Crystal would stand on the back pegs on the wheels, right? Yep. I remember doing that. Yeah. Uh Heck yeah. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, the two girls showed up at the home of their friend Hector. They played football with him for about an hour, but when Hector's family went out for ice cream, Crystal and Laura had to leave. So the girls then headed to another friend's house. That friend wasn't there, so the girl played in the hammock in her backyard, assuming that, you know, when she came home, they'd just play, right? Mm -hmm. They just waited for her in the backyard. The girls stayed till about 4 p.m., but eventually they realized that this girlfriend wouldn't be home anytime soon, so they moved on. And shortly after that, a neighbor spotted them and said that the girls were on Laura's bike talking to a young man who looked to be about 15 years old. Laura and Crystal were not seen after that. Oh. The mothers became a little concerned when neither girl made it home for dinner, and it wasn't like them to be late. Laura's curfew was at 7 p.m., and both families started to worry when curfew came and went and the girls hadn't returned. Both families searched for the girl up and down the street, stopping to ask other neighbors if they had been, you know, have you seen Laura and Crystal? Nobody had. Mothers called the police to report them missing at about 9 p.m., and it had already been dark for a half an hour. They knew something was seriously wrong. Fears mounted overnight as dawn broke the next day and there was no sign of the girls. Family, friends, neighbors, and schoolmates all showed up at the Hobbs and Tobias homes. Some helped in the search, others fielded phone calls, and some 
like Alberto's friend George, answered the door and fended off reporters. Laura's father, Jerry Hobbs, and her grandpa, Holiba, were in the woods in Beulah Park at first light. Others were searching the woods that morning, too. Ominously, they came upon Laura's bike lying abandoned on its side. Ugh. Moments later, Jerry saw something through the foliage and dove through the thicket. Mr. Holiba heard him scream and without hesitation ran after him. He heard Jerry yell, over here, they're dead, they're <gasps> dead. Mm. Jerry Hobbs had just found the, the dead bodies of his eight-year-old daughter and her nine-year-old friend, Crystal. They were face up, fully dressed, lying side by side with their shoes laid neatly next to them. Searchers in the woods called 911. Jerry Hobbs can be heard moaning and crying in the background of the call. An autopsy would later reveal that Crystal Tobias had 11 stab wounds, several in her neck, and one puncturing her liver. Laura Hobbs, however, had been stabbed over 20 times, nine in which were in the neck, and two of the stab wounds had been purposefully delivered to her eyes. Ugh. The examination also revealed significant male DNA in Laura's right hand. A little while later, Crystal's mother, Marina, spoke with Sheila Holiba, asking if she had heard any news of the girl's whereabouts. Sheila responded with, Haven't you heard? They've been found, and they're dead. Oh. Authorities, of course, brought the family of the two girls in for questioning. They were released one by one, except for Laura's father, Jerry Hobbs. Jerry was kept for more intense questioning. After 20 hours of grueling interrogation, mm. Jerry Hobbs signed a confession and was arrested for the murder of both girls. He signed his confession in the early hours of May 10th, but didn't do a video recording of it until 2 p.m. that day. In his confession, Jerry Hobbs said that he had gone looking for Laura that evening to bring her home. When he found the two girls, Laura refused to go home with him. Already angry with Laura because she was supposed to be grounded, he became enraged and began beating her. That's when Crystal came to the aid of her friend and pulled a knife on Jerry. He grabbed the knife from her and used that as a weapon. Most prosecutors didn't believe that Crystal had a weapon on her and that Jerry had gone into the woods to find them with the knife already. I have the link on the show notes of the confession video, and he's fine until he starts to describe the murder. Then he starts to, like, really break down. Hmm. Sheila Holiba and her father, whom Jerry had lived with for the past month, didn't believe Jerry murdered the girls. In Sheila's words, he's being railroaded. While most wives and family members can't believe their loved ones are capable of murder, there did seem to be genuine problems with Jerry's confession. Jerry had no blood on him on Sunday evening, and there was no blood found in his house. The murder weapon was also not found in his home or anywhere on him, and he hadn't behaved unusual that afternoon or evening either. There was no shred of physical evidence connecting him to the crime scene. I mean, how did he stab two girls 31 times? and come home with no blood anywhere on him. Mm -hmm. Or even some wounds any slippage. What's more, while Jerry was known to have a short temper and be violent, he'd never been known to be overly aggressive or violent with his children. The idea that he became so enraged that he stabbed her, his daughter, and her friends simply because she refused to come home seemed overboard, mm -hmm. even for Jerry. The state's attorney, M.J. Waller, said in a press release, that they became suspicious of Jerry when he said in a statement that he had got no closer than 20 feet when he found the girls because he just couldn't bring himself to get any closer. However, Jerry gave a fairly accurate description of their wounds, which prosecutors claimed he couldn't have seen from the distance of 20 feet. They claim he had to be much closer than 20 feet. Quote, this was all about rage, Waller said. So basically without knowing for sure if he was 20 feet away. I mean, who stops to measure, right? It's just a guesstimate. And plus, he was hysterical. He just found his murdered daughter. They pretty much, I believe, think thought that his history of assault and violence and the fact that he was lying about ho how close he got to the bodies, that, that was pretty much the, all the proof they needed that he mur had murdered these two little girls, one of whom was his daughter. Mm-hmm. The next day, the newspapers ran a story in which the opening paragraph reads, quote, 
The man accused of stabbing to death his eight-year-old daughter and her best friend hunted his child down in a park in a fit of rage because she was supposed to be grounded for stealing money, prosecutors said Wednesday. Mm -hmm. With articles like that, public Mm -hmm. opinion is pretty much cemented quickly. On June 1st, a grand jury indicted Jerry Hobbs for the murder of both girls. And as often is the case, people who confess to a crime often deny it later. And Jerry was no different, pleading not guilty on June 9th. He claimed his confession was coerced and that he was denied access to a lawyer. The neighborhood was thrown into shock and deep depression, with parents vowing to keep their children safe. Many parents waffled back and forth between ensuring safety and encouraging independence, which has been a much debated topic among parents since the dawn of time. The parents of the friends the girls played with and wanted to play with that day expressed guilt and sorrow for not being home when Laura and Crystal wished to play. And in separate statements, they both said the same thing. You know, if we would have been home, maybe they'd still be alive. Which the guilt, I can't. Yeah, you, you, it's not their if, fault, yeah, but you'd still course. have that guilt. Always. What if I did this? What if I did that? Exactly. If we wouldn't have gone for ice cream, if we would have taken the girls with us to go for ice cream. Yeah. Crystal Tobias was buried on May 15th, 2005. Her white casket was draped with pink roses. Inside the casket, Crystal wore a white dress and was surrounded by stuffed animals. Laura Hobbs was buried the next day, also in a white coffin. She wore a red dress and was buried with a Barbie and a white teddy bear. It's heartbreaking. Mm, mm -mm. Laura's mother, while grappling with the idea of Jerry's arrest, endured her daughter's funeral among the whispers of accusatory gossip. And she stated, quote, I leave my little girl in God's hands now. She feels no more pain and sorrow and will never have a reason not to smile. In 2006, Lake County Judge Fred Foreman agreed to review the personnel records of the Waukegan police officer that Jerry accused of coercion. The judge ruled that his confession had not been coerced and allowed his confession to be admitted as evidence. While awaiting trial, Jerry's defense team decided to retain a private laboratory to re-examine the evidence in this case. The lab found semen in Laura's body, which her original autopsy had missed. Or they just immediately suspected the father, you know, so they didn't check for it, right? Really? So, mm -hmm. Laura had been raped, Mm -hmm. and her killer had taken the time to redress her after the crime. So if Jerry's lawyers had not been convinced of his innocence before, they were now. Uh, The fact that Laura had been raped swung the motive for the case in the opposite direction. These girls weren't killed because Laura had disobeyed. This was sexual assault. This was predatorial. The real home run for the defense team was that the DNA found in and on Laura did not belong to Jerry Hobbs. Oh. But not so fast. Oh. In 2008, the defense attorney for Hobbs entered the evidence to the court that the DNA taken from Laura Hobbs' body didn't match Jerry Hobbs. This means that whoever semen was found in Laura did not belong to her father, and therefore Jerry Hobbs should be cleared, charges dropped, and released. But the prosecutors, <laughs> right, the prosecutors claimed that the area where their bodies were found was a known makeout spot for the locals. And that could explain how Laura got the foreign DNA on her. Because remember, there's some semen found in her hand, Mm -hmm. right? But that didn't explain how the DNA got inside of Mm -hmm. her, though. Mm -hmm. So they took it a step further and said that just because the DNA didn't match Jerry, it also didn't mean that Jerry wasn't there. The whole story has changed, right? And now they're saying that Jerry stood by while someone else raped his daughter, and then Jerry killed the girls. That's far-fetched at the least. At best, right? Yeah. It's a work of fiction. So in 2008, Jerry had not been convicted, but was still being held in prison without bail, still awaiting trial. This has been three years. Mm. His defense team tried to get the judge to grant him bail based on the new DNA evidence, but George Foreman said that, quote, the DNA evidence was not enough to convince him to set bail at this time. Really? But, you know, DNA evidence is good enough to send people to the death chamber. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just not good enough for Jerry Hobbs to get bail. Because they were going after the death penalty for Jerry. Next two years, Jerry Hobbs would languish in jail waiting for a trial, knowing that the death penalty could be on the table. This is five years in jail.
In July 2009, Amanda Jean Snell was busy enjoying her job in Arlington, Virginia. Born in San Bernardino, California in 1989, Amanda was a Navy intelligence specialist second class who worked for the Pentagon. She was always prompt, she was a hard worker, and she was a volunteer youth minister at the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Alexandria. Amanda recently decided that after her Navy career, she wanted to teach special education. On the morning of July 13th, Amanda failed to show up for work. Her supervisor knew that something had to be wrong, so they headed to her barrack storm room at the Joint Base Meyer-Henderson Hall to check on her. Her door was unlocked. When they went in, nothing seemed to be out of place, and the bed was made. Still, something didn't sit well with him. So he checked the closet and the locker. There, folded with her head covered in a pillowcase oh. and her feet pressed against the locker wall, was the body of 20-year-old Amanda. Oh. NCIS was called in, and they interviewed everyone in the building. Nobody heard or saw anything. They noticed that the top sheet was missing from her bed, even though it had been neatly made. It is possible that Amanda didn't own a top sheet, but it was odd enough that the investigators removed the bottom sheet, bagged it, and sent it to the lab. The coroner said that there was no signs of bruising or signs of a struggle. They went on to say that there was no sign of rape and no indication of recent sexual activity. So the coroner gave the cause of death as undetermined. Amanda Snell's family was devastated and unsure of what to make of that ruling. They had told investigators that she was prone to migraine headaches and that she would often find a dark place to sit and cover her head while riding out the migraine. Even though Amanda's laptop and iPod were missing, there were shoe prints in front of a locker that didn't belong to her, and she had abrasions on the top of her feet indicating that she had been dragged. Investigators still felt Amanda could have gone into that locker, put the pillowcase over her head, and accidentally suffocated. No. Thank you. That's ridiculous. One NCIS agent was never comfortable with the undetermined ruling and didn't agree with the accidental suffocation theory. Thank you. Since Amanda's death was not ruled a homicide, the bedding wasn't given priority of the backlog evidence waiting to be tested. And the sheet would sit there until seven months later in February of 2010 when Snowmageddon hit Washington, D.C. February 5th, 2010, Arlington Police Corporal T.L. Clifford was on his usual midnight patrol the night that the snow smothered D.C. Many residents were out of power, most were snowed in, and their vehicles buried in the snow up to the top of their tires. But emergency workers still had to be out and about. Early morning, Clifford saw a silver Dodge Durango driving around the neighborhood. He first noticed the vehicle simply because he used to have one like it. But then he noticed that the driver didn't seem to have any specific destination, which, you know, kind of stood out the night when a foot of snow was mm -hmm. coming down. Mm -hmm. An hour later, he saw the vehicle again on Four Mile Run. The driver of the Durango parked between two trucks near a bike path and turned his lights off, and then he idled there for about 15 minutes. Ooh. Clifford thought this guy was looking to steal a car or commit a robbery of some kind, mm -hmm. so Officer Clifford ran the plates. The driver had no outstanding warrants and had never been arrested. Still, it bugged him. So he wrote the plate number on a business card and stuffed it in his jacket pocket. Hmm, smart. Mm -hmm. The next night, Clifford saw the Durango again and noticed the same kind of stalking behavior. He watched the car and driver through binoculars and radioed Officer Nuselli, who was another overnight police officer, and told him to watch out for the Durango. The only people who should have been out on the road that night were snowplows, cops, emergency workers, and people with a valid emergency. You know how horrible the roads get. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. When like nobody's getting, out. Right. Like a foot of snow, snow in an hour. Yeah. Right. You, you don't go outside. No. And nurses and police officers. That's about it. Exactly. Snowplows. That's it. Nuselli responded that he had also noticed the vehicle on his nightly patrols. Later on that same shift, Nuselli and Clifford saw the Durango drive by with the window down, and they got a glimpse of a young man wearing a dark wool hat. Five nights later, on February 10th, another snowstorm hit the D.C. area. When a night shift nurse at a local hospital, we're going to call her Ann Downey, because it's a pseudonym. Okay. When Ann got off work, she took the metro to her boyfriend's house. There were no cabs around when she arrived at her stop, 
and so she just decided to walk. A few other people were walking, since it was the best way to get around the short distances with all the snow. She kind of picked up her pace when she realized she was alone on Quincy Street. That quietness that you get when Mm -hmm. the snow falls, yeah, that'd be a little bit disheartening. Suddenly, a man approached her from the side. Honey, he said, keep on walking. Anne's heart raced. The man had a gun. Oh. And thinking this was a robbery, she offered him a purse and belongings. And shut up and keep walking, he said. Anne was frantic. Her boyfriend's house was on this street, just a short distance away. And the man led her to an SUV, which was a light-colored Durango. We're going to get in the car, he said. Anne managed to twist around and got a good look at the man's face, and he pulled out a knife. No, I'm not getting in the car, she said, and the man insisted. And she said, don't hurt me. I'm not getting in that car. And then Anne tossed her purse and bolted to her boyfriend's house. Oh, good. The whole way there, she thought, he's going to shoot me in the back. He's going to shoot me in the back. But you know what? She didn't care. Instinctively, she knew that if she got into the car, her fate would be worse than being shot in the back. Never go to the second location. Thank you. Luckily, the shots never came. She made it to her boyfriend's house and banged on the front door, screaming. And as Anne shoved her way into the house, she looked back into the street, but the man and the Durango were gone. She called 911. She couldn't remember the vehicle's exact color, only that it was light-colored. And the police put out a bolo for the Durango. And when Officer Clifford heard the bolo, he said, you know what, that might be the one I'd been watching. Mm -hmm. But some of his co-workers brushed it off. So Clifford, thinking he might just be jumping to conclusions, didn't share a suspicion with anybody else. Mm -mm. Two weeks later, on February 26, 2010, Maria Jones, also a pseudonym, pseudonym, was walking home to her apartment on North Wakefield at 2 a.m. Suddenly, a young man approached her from behind and told her that he had a gun. You're getting in my car, he said. Like Anne Downey, Maria Jones refused to get in his car. A struggle ensued, and Maria fought back with all of her strength. The man pulled a stun gun from his pocket and zapped her in the neck. But Maria, knowing her life was on the line, fought back. Good. The stun gun from the taser didn't knock her down at all. Her, I guess, Good. adrenaline was going. I would say so. Yeah, and her assailant was dumbfounded that the taser hadn't brought her to her knees. So Maria took advantage of him being shocked, and she ran into her apartment and dialed 911. Maria hadn't seen the vehicle that the man was driving, but she did give the police a good description. He was short, young, and could have passed for a teenager. Oh. 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 Two hours later, Lisa Howard and Tammy Davis, also pseudonyms, were on their way home from a night out on the town. The two college students, both 23, had taken the metro earlier that night to Woodley Park, where they attended a party, and then they went to the Brass Monkey which is a local bar. And I, every time I hear Brass Monkey, I have to sing Beastie that Boys. funky monkey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my apologies. Yeah. Afterwards, they stopped at IHOP and got breakfast. At about 4 a.m., they headed back to Lisa's house where they planned to sleep off the night's fun. As they stepped onto the front porch, the two paused while Lisa hunted for her keys. Lisa heard a twig snap from behind her. She turned to see a man on the porch who told her, Give me your wallets. I have a gun. Keep your voices down and open the door. Terrified, the women did as he instructed. The man followed Lisa and Tammy into the house and threw their purses on the couch. He then asked if there was anybody else in the home. Knowing that her roommate was sleeping upstairs, Lisa told him no, nobody else was in the house. He then made them kneel on the floor. After he patted them down, he tied their hands and feet with a vacuum cleaner cord. He let them alone long enough to retrieve a knife from the kitchen, and when he returned, the women were almost out of their restraints. Angry, he retied Lisa with the vacuum cord and Tammy with a cord from an iron. He ordered them into the bedroom, telling them to get onto the bed. No, absolutely not, Tammy said. This seemed to confuse him. The man tried taping Lisa's mouth with Blue's painter's tape, but it, of course it comes off. That stuff's not sticky at all. So then he asked them if they had any masking tape, and he left the room and went off to look for something different, some other kind of tape to use. When he left the room, Lisa threw herself at the door and shut it, and even though the man had patted them down, he had missed Tammy's cell phone. So Lisa got out Tammy's phone and called 911, 
and threw it into the clothes basket, hoping the man wouldn't see it when he returned. But unfortunately, when the man barged through the door, the phone was still lit up. Oh. And so he was able to see it. And he grabbed the phone out of the basket and threw it against the wall and shattered it. Knowing the police could be on their way, at about 4.25 a.m., he dragged Tammy out to his vehicle, which was a silver SUV, and threw her in the back seat. Still tied to the vacuum cleaner, Lisa dragged it to the door, hoping to get a good look at the vehicle. She then began banging the vacuum cleaner around and screaming until her roommate woke up and came downstairs to see what was happening. As soon as her roommate untied her, Lisa redialed 911. The police immediately put out an APB for Tammy. In the silver Dodge Durango, Tammy desperately clung to the hope that the police would find her. She took note of things in his car, and she tried to memorize the turns he took. She's smart. She kept her wits. Mm -hmm. Then he parked the car, and he raped her. As he put on a condom, he said to her, yeah, I'm not an idiot. <sighs> uh-huh. Yeah, you are. Afterwards, he wrapped her head in packing tape, pushed her down into the floorboard, and drove for a long while. Then suddenly, Tammy could feel rough terrain. The car was no longer on a major road. And at this point, her kidnapper slash rapist made her perform another sexual act. Then the man tied Tammy's scarf around her neck and started to squeeze. What are you doing? She cried out. What do you think I'm doing? Her attacker replied. Tammy felt her eyes bulging. and She couldn't breathe. And then it all went black. Tammy woke up face down in the snow the following day with her arms over her head. She rolled over and stared up at the sky. Her head was bleeding, and her legs were raw from the knees down where she'd been dragged and dumped. Try as she might, she couldn't stand up. Her legs were shaky and weak, and she heard a car pass by somewhere, so that meant that there was a road nearby. She had to make it there, so she dragged herself along the snow until she finally mustered the strength to stand up. Inch by inch, she raised herself up. She was freezing, and she was bloody, and she was half naked but she was on the road. And then the car stopped, and then a warm blanket was put around her. With three of the four women describing a silver Durango or a light-colored SUV, it didn't take long for Officer Nuselli to call up Officer Clifford and saying, you know what, remember that car in the snowstorm? He's like, yeah, I have a feeling it might be the same vehicle. Do you, any by chance, remember the tag? Clifford recalled writing it down, but couldn't remember where he put it. However, he did run the tags through the electronic system of Virginia license plates, so Clifford told Nuselli to check with the ECC, which was the Emergency Communications Center. It took about two hours for the ECC to print out every license plate that had been run during the three-night snowstorm because the online system for the state police was down. The silver Dodge Durango finally showed up on the list. They got the driver's license of the man who owned it. His name was Jorge. George Alvila Torres, a Marine at the Joint Base Meyer-Henderson Hall. All documents say Torres, but his real name is actually Avia-Torres. Mm -hmm. But like the state versus Torres, mm -hmm. it's not Alvia-Torres. So I'm just going to go with Torres. You that's think that's fine. okay? Yeah. Because I really don't want to say Alvia-Torres, Alvila-Torres, Alvila. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. As long Because yeah. last time we did it, the, the killer's name was Harper Chadwick. It was hyphened. I got a couple letters saying that they hated that. All the women identified Torres out of the photo lineup as the man who tried to kidnap them. Tammy said it was definitely the man who had abducted and raped her and left her for dead. This gave police enough to get an arrest warrant. To find Torres, they needed the equivalent of a military search warrant because he was a Marine living in military housing, which fell under the jurisdiction of NCIS and Mark Harmon. <laughs> And say yes, gave the warrant without hesitation because, you know, yeah, duh, right? Mm -hmm. Since Nuselli was the only cop on duty who had seen the Durango, he went to the base with Detective Fortunato. They found Torres's Durango parked on the first level. Fortunato then called Detective Stone, who was at the hospital with Tammy Davis. He told Stone that they were sure it was the right vehicle, but wondered if Tammy could possibly tell them what was inside the car. Mm. And she did. Tammy said that there was a boombox which Fortunato confirmed was in the back seat. Oh. Tammy then told them that she had been bound with a cord of an iron. And I see the iron, Fortunato said. Torres hadn't bothered to remove the iron from his car or didn't even have the car cleaned. <sighs> Inside, they found Tammy's college ID, one of her earrings, and many spots of blood. 
They also found a stun gun on the console. While detectives were celebrating the arrest of Torres, they also sighed with relief that they caught him before he could rape anybody else or possibly escalate to murder. Hmm. That was until they ran his DNA mm-hmm. through CODIS. Mm-hmm. Knew that was coming. Now, Virginia was the first state in the country to collect a perpetrator's DNA upon arrest. At the time, the rest of the states only collected DNA after the suspect was charged or after conviction. The guidelines in each state also vary regarding of what type of crime is required to collect DNA. So some states don't collect DNA for nonviolent crimes. Upon hearing that Torres was arrested for a brutal rape and attempted murder, the NCIS officer noticed that Torres had lived on the same floor, just seven doors down from Amanda Snell. Oh. And he had even been interviewed regarding her death. Oh. The officer decided to check on the status of Amanda's sheet, which had been sent off for testing, and he was relieved that the sheet was still in storage, but no test had been run. He immediately bumped the sheet up the priority list. Even though the autopsy had claimed that Amanda Snell had not been raped or had recently consensual sex, her sheet revealed a semen stain. And who did it belong to? Ding, ding, ding. George Avila Torres. Arlington police had not just captured a rapist, they had captured a murderer. Detectives built their case around Torres for the attempted abductions and the rape of Tammy Davis. They seized his computer from his room along with a Glock. And uh, a search of his computer showed that he had a nice little porn collection with a specific preference to sleep rape, Mm. suffocation rape, and violent sexual encounters. Shocking, huh? They also found that he had been searching for directions on how to make and how to use chloroform. When the lab results came back on the Tammy Davis rape case, it was Torres' semen on Tammy. It was also confirmed that her blood was in his car and on his clothes. On May 17th, 2010, George Avila Torres was indicted for rape, abduction, abduction with intent to defile, robbery, use of a firearm, and more. Torres pleaded not guilty. The media and law enforcement alike were all wondering, I mean, who is this man? So you know what, Cam? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you who he is. We know he's not a nice guy and we don't like him. He's not. No. Born in 1988, Jorge Avila Torres, who went by George, grew up on the shores of Lake Michigan. He was from a good family, and as a child, he loved knives, cars, and trucks. Friends described him as solid, dependable, and giving. As a teenager, he had been caught with marijuana in the fall of his senior year. And, of course, the school kicked him out, and he had to finish senior year at a different school. As soon as he graduated high school, he joined the Marines and spent two years in Okinawa, Japan. There was nothing in his past besides that one blip in high school that would raise any red flags. Later that summer in 2010, two detectives from Zion, Illinois, appeared in Arlington. They came with a DNA report and a story about the murder and sexual assault of two little girls, Laura Hobbs and Crystal Tobias. The DNA matched George Avia Torres. Now, George lived just a few blocks away from the girls in Zion, Illinois. And in fact, he had been really good friends with Crystal's older brother, Alberto. He and Alberto hung out all the time. And on the day that the girls were discovered murder, Torres had been the friend who had answered the door to keep the reporters at bay for the family. He was mm. 16 years old at the time. Mm. A wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm-hmm. While awaiting trial, Torres told a fellow inmate, Osama El Atari, that he had strangled Amanda Snell with a cord of her laptop and dragged her body to the closet. When El Atari asked him why he killed her, Torres responded with, quote, For the adrenaline, because I could. He also confessed to killing Laura and Crystal. When El Atari asked him, Don't you feel bad about killing two little girls? Torres responded, quote, Does a lion feel remorse when it kills a hyena? Torres went on to tell El Atari that he planned to get off with an insanity play, and if that didn't work, he would hire somebody to kill the witnesses. Mm-hmm. He also falsely confessed to El Atari that he had committed many other crimes and told El Atari that some of his confessions were lies, so he wouldn't be able to tell which ones Torres had actually committed. 
Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He, yeah, totally. Okay. Therefore, Elatari wouldn't be able to snitch on him. But Elatari was wearing a wire. I was going to say, it doesn't quite work like that, buddy, but okay. Mm-hmm. All the women Torres attempted to abduct, plus Tammy Davis, testified against him, even though they knew that he was plotting for their murders from jail. And a jury found him guilty. For the sentencing phase, the women all came back, gave a victim impact speech. And one of them said she was always angry and constantly looked over her shoulder. Another said she used to be a strong, independent woman. And now she said she always has to have somebody with her. Her sense of security was gone. The judge sentenced Torres to five life sentences plus an additional 165 years. The judge called him a predator and a coward and told him, quote, you were never a Marine. Mm -mm. But it wasn't over for George Avila Torres. Based on DNA and shoe prints, he was later convicted for the murder of Amanda Snell and was sentenced to death. Torres told his lawyers to not fight the death penalty. He was later indicted for the murders of Laura Hobbs and Crystal Tobias. He eventually pled guilty to the girls' murders in exchange for 100 years imprisonment and a transfer from Red Onion State Prison, which he hated. Hmm. At his sentencing, presiding Justice Daniel Shaines told Torres that he was a serial killer, and if he had even a spark of goodness, it was so far out of his reach that it was unattainable. Jerry Hobbs was exonerated and set free for the murder of his daughter, Lauren, and her friend, Crystal. After spending five years in jail, awaiting a trial, and having the whole world think he murdered and raped his own child, Jerry was a broken man. Sitting in jail knowing he was innocent, he had to live with the fact that the person who actually killed his daughter was walking free. He had to mourn his little girl all by himself. Hobbs had a substance abuse problem to begin with, but spending five years in jail for a crime he didn't commit was more than Jerry Hobbs was equipped to handle. Upon release, he sued various Lake County, Illinois agencies and was awarded $8 million in damages, but received no apologies from the prosecutors. Mm. Regardless of the money, his demons still stalked him. He was arrested and imprisoned on various drug charges shortly after that. However, he's not the only person falsely accused that spent time in prison in Lake County. There's two other cases involving DNA that didn't match the suspect that also resulted in prison sentences for both men. I mean, what's the point of scientific DNA evidence if it's just going to be ignored, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. especially if it doesn't support the prosecutor's theories. But what a slippery slope. Officer Clifford regrets not pulling that silver Durango over when he had the chance, and he regrets not speaking up when he first heard about the bolo for the SUV. He's posted a photo of Torres on his wall with a reminder, never second-guess yourself. How much longer could Tammy Davis have survived on that cold, snowing morning if the loves hadn't seen her and stopped by? I mean, who knows how many more victims there would have been Mm -hmm. before the police caught Torres if Tammy had died. Torres is behind bars because the determination of one woman to survive, the blind luck of being found by good Samaritans, the bravery of other victims to come forward and testify, and the excellent police work in Arlington, Virginia. Just want everybody to know that the information about the takedown and the arrest of Torres came from an excellent article written by Harry Jaffe for the Washingtonian in 2012, and I'll link the article and the show notes, but it's a really good article. They also interviewed him on a TV show too. Just amazed like when all, everything aligns. How many times do I say this on the podcast, but it's true. And just Mm -hmm. how, you know, that, he started at 16. Well, he picked those babies because he knew that was his first outing, you mm -hmm. know, and he wanted to be successful. They interviewed Alberto in one of the documentaries and he talks about how George always seemed kind of jealous of Alberto, I think, Mm -hmm. because Alberto, very cute kid, cute man, had better luck with the ladies. And all the ladies that Torres would try to connect with didn't like him, thought he was kind of weird, kind of odd. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, I guess that could be the reason. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist, but he didn't have any kind of rapport with women, Mm -hmm. which makes sense that he's a rapist, right? And, you know, people always ask what draws us to certain cases. Mm -hmm. I saw a little article. I forgot if it was an article or a little something about this case. When Jerry Hobbs 
was released from jail. Mm -hmm. He was interviewed by the New York Times and a reporter asked him why he confessed to killing the Mm -hmm. daughters, right? Mm -hmm. Why? That's what I would, why did you confess? If you didn't do it, why did you confess, Right. right? And he said, I found my daughter. I was already broken. They didn't have to break me. Yeah. And that just kind of stuck with me. There was another case we did, I think, where the parent, like they're not in their right mind. You mm-hmm. can't interrogate somebody then. And then their daughter had died. But not only that, he found her. I mean, right. you you are not. In your right mind. Yeah. I mean, he probably had no sleep the night before. The girls went missing like at seven. They searched. No sleep. Up at dawn the next day. Mm -hmm. Sure. By the time he was interviewed and interrogated, Mm -hmm. he was most likely exhausted and just filled with grief. And at that that, mm -hmm. yeah. You know? And yeah, just horrible. Wow. I don't even know what to say. You know, I I think about... So that Marine had to know somebody else was doing time for his crime. And I know that this makes no sense because obviously he's a psychopath. But I just always think, wouldn't you feel badly about that? Mm-hmm. You I know? would. But that's I would. normal people thinking. Well, he was 16 when it happened and he was friends with one of the girl's brothers, right? Yeah, he had any he would remorse whatsoever. follow that. Right. He still graduated in that same area. Went to a different school, so he would have known that Jerry Hobbs went to prison, and he was probably relieved that the police just stopped there. But he spent five years in jail, not even a trial. Mm -mm. Aren't you guaranteed a quick trial? Mm -hmm. A speedy trial? Yes. Yeah, five years is speedy in their books sometimes. Who did you listen to? I listened to our friend Margo from Military Murder. She covered this, and Mm -hmm. she said something that she had a friend or something that said that it was his own attorney, his court-appointed attorney, that kept filing appeals and stuff, which kept him in prison. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand how that works. Yeah, me either. Hmm. I don't. And she didn't really go into it any more than that. Hmm. I don't know, but it's such an injustice. And to spend five years in jail without any sign of anything going to trial. And come on, the judge didn't believe the DNA, the DNA being... It's amazing since the DNA doesn't lie. You know? Right, exactly. And like I said, it's good enough for the death penalty. Why isn't it good enough for bail? Well, because right? They can put him on death penalty for having, mm, I don't know. Like I always say, it's a lot easier to get into jail than it is to get out. Because once you're uh-huh. in there, nobody you're wants to stuck. listen. Yeah, nobody uh. wants to listen. They don't care. So, yep. mm-hmm. I know. And that goes, but, you know, with that false confession thing, too, that people just say, well, I'm going to admit it now and then, you know, I'll have my attorney we'll get, get out, me yeah. out later. Just nope. I need some rest from the Never police. The police happens. are hounding me. Never mm. happens. Sad story. Sad case. Very. Well, you did a good job. That's awful. Uh-huh. I cannot. Also always interested by these people. Like he's a Marine by day. Uh-huh. Right. So they, they have a seemingly normal life, but then they have that. And that is just... I don't even know. Like, did anybody see any signs? Did he have any friends? Did as they, far as I know, I know? Mean, he had. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I can't. That's I more rhetorical. That but yeah, he had Alberto. Like they were friends in high school. They hung out all the time. Just wonder about if military. I don't know. Little comments, though. You know, like you just think. But then I don't know how boys act. Boys talk so tough all the time, anyway, right? Well, and I think or that young men. You, you. That's not what you think of your friends. So even if they said that, you'd be like, "You're so weird. You're so funny." And, when your friends say that, men, if there is something odd, you need to stand up and say something. You just can't let those kind of comments go free either. I mean, those joking sexual assault passing comments are, you know what I'm, oh, you know I what know. I'm saying, Camille. I know, but it's, you know. You have to call people out on those. You can't just let those pass. Be the one to stand up. Good job, Jen. Thanks. That's uh, awful. Jen, I don't know if yep. you've heard. Our what? True Tell Crime me. podcast is going to Europe. No way. Yes, we are. We are going to Europe. We have a few spots left, and we would very, very much like our listeners, who are soon going to be our new best friends, to come with us. But tr- we would love you guys to come with us. The trip is not this summer, mind you. It is not a couple months away. It is over a year away, June mm-hmm. 13th through June 22nd of 2025. So again, not right. this summer, next summer. We are going to Scotland. We right. are going to York and we are going to London. We will be doing all kinds of fun things, but you will also have a little downtime on your own. 
but we're going to be doing all things scary. I guess is kind of how we say it. We've dubbed it the Dark History Tour. You will not find another tour like this. We had this created solely based on what we wanted to do. We got a company that would, you know, they went to bat for us and hopefully we're going to just love them for that. I and was talking to a guy the other day and he, from the tour company, he's filling in for the woman that normally helps us. And he's like, wow, you guys made this all yourself. This is, you know, he goes, this is not anything that we normally do. This is custom made. And I'm like, I know we wanted to do, I go, we had gone to another company to ask them, but they were pretty strict on what they would allow us to do. So that's why we choose your, we chose your company. We choose you. Because you allowed us to customize what we wanted to do. Yes. Like they actually, we said we like this tour and they found a tour that would do it for us. Yes. So that's pretty amazing. Because so. we're, we're pretty cool. We want you to come with us. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us on all the socials, of course, or you can check out our web page, our website, rather, our true crime podcast.com. And if you have any questions, our true crime podcast at gmail.com. If you're trying to book online and you have any problems, make sure you get in touch with me. I will get it taken care of ASAP. People are coming for all different reasons. We just had one recently book who's going to celebrate their birthday <gasps> with us. It's a milestone birthday. And they booked it. And I'm so excited. I can't wait to celebrate a birthday overseas. That is going to be so fun. Um, I love it. It is. So if you're worried about traveling alone, don't be. You have Cam and I, who you already know. No. You might not have met us face to face, but it's the same. You get us pretty much what how we are here on here. What you're going to yeah. get. So, yep. yeah. So we might bicker with each other a little bit more, but we're pretty we're gonna much try to behave. Where you are. We're going to try yeah. to behave. I say that um, a year and a half away. Stay tuned. <laughs> we will. But anyway, we'd love for you to come with us. It's going to be a good time. I'm really looking forward to it. I have like a little markdown calendar. So, oh, I'm going to do that. I didn't even think mm-hmm. about that. Also, yep. just so you know, it's not all inclusive, but it's pretty darn close. So, we oh, yeah. have two complete dinners with drinks, beer, and wine, all you can drink, which is, you know, I think one's a mystery dinner, I, I a think murder that, mystery dinner. Yes. I think that's what the last one is, our last night there. Um, How fun is that? A murder mystery dinner overseas <laughs> with accents and everything. <laughs> it's like a real Agatha Christie novel come to life. It is. It is. Uh, also, breakfast every day is served, and it's not mm-hmm. the continental breakfast like here in the States. It's usually pretty good. Uh, and the way I kind of work it is I scarf down breakfast, usually skip lunch, maybe get a little light snack, and then uh, spring for dinner just to save a little money. But um, yeah, so we get our own personal tour guide who will be with us from the minute we land in Scotland and they will stay the whole time with us. Then we get our own individualized tour guides for each tour that we Mm -hmm. do. Your price of your airline fee is included. Your plane ticket is included unless you have like miles or something that you want to use, then they can take that off. But otherwise, you pay for your flight Somebody will pick you up at the airport and take you directly to the hotel that we're staying in. And then when it's time to leave, they will drive you to the airport and send you on your way. But otherwise, once you get there, they're going to take you to the hotel where Camille and I will probably meet you at the bar. That's right. We'll be at the bar. So, mm-hmm. Welcoming we will everybody. Come greet you. We will greet you when you come in. That is Unless, correct. Depending on the time. Yes. But most likely that's what we'll be doing. Well, we'll be but jet anyway, lagged, So, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe jet lagged. I don't know. But anyway, we would love for you to come. It's going to be a great time. So and fun. like I said, or we said, there's only a few seats left. So if you want to book, you might want to do that now. Sooner so than we can later. get you on and get everything situated. And I do believe that there could be a price increase at the first of the month, but not necessarily. We just don't know. It just depends on what's going on out there in the world. That is really out of our control because, you know, if it was up to me and Jen, we'd all be going for free. Right. But it's just the airlines and such yeah. like that. If they did, you know how they're on. You know, you know how it is. Yeah. All right. Did we so anyway, we'd else? love you to go. All right, Jen. Until next time. Remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. And come fly with us. Come fly with me. Come fly with me. I get no kick from champagne. All right. Okay. See, See bye. ya. Bye. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. 
Original music and audio mix of all our true crime podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our true crime podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.